Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to our virtual Davison Assembly of God gathering today on Sunday morning. And it's so good to see each one of you and have you all with us today and be gathered together. And we're going to look to worship today for a few moments, and then we're going to look at uh, the Word of God in John chapter 21, so you can get ready in your Bible there, John chapter 21, the first part of the chapter. And uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, and we will raise a hallelujah to the Lord our God. And uh, we're so blessed to be able to uh, gather together in this way. So let's enjoy worship and just begin to worship the Lord. Father God, I pray that you would touch every heart, touch every life today, open our spirit, help us to worship you. I pray for a special visitation of the power of your Holy Spirit today in each heart and each life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.
morning, I want to continue on with our teaching of Jesus after his death and resurrection, because I think it's very significant, and we need to see the resurrected Lord, the resurrected Jesus. And today we're going to see the resurrected Lord as the disciples saw him once again, John chapter 21. Beginning with verse 1, I want to read, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and, the two other, and two other disciples were together. I'm going fi out fishing, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll all go along with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you found, got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side. It said, really, the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did this, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the, disciples whom Je the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. And jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, and they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, coals there, and with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon P Peter climbed aboard, aboard, aboard the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, uh, took bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And I just want to pick out some thoughts for us this morning. First one that we look at is the disciples went back to what they knew. When you are out of control and things just don't seem normal, we can go back to what we know. And in the big picture of things, our everyday choices matter more than we think. Significance seems to slip out of our lives when things seemed out of control. They went back to the Sea of Galilee. Now, John wrote this closer to the 90s, later in that century. And uh, the emperor had built a city along the Sea of Galilee uh, about mid-century, mid-early century, and he called the cities Tiberias. And after that point, uh, they started calling this the Sea of Tiberias. So you'll see in some writings it says Sea of Galilee, and this is the Sea of Tiberias. It's the same one, just later date, and uh, it was known as this one. So when you don't know which way to turn, occupy until further notice. Occupy until further notice. Do the things that you know to do. Keep doing the last thing that Jesus asked you to do. Uh, catch up on some Jesus tasks for you. If Jesus had asked you to do something and you didn't do it, start to do it. If there was uh, a study in the Bible that you wanted to make, there are some books that you wanted to read and you haven't done it, do it. This is a time to do it. For, for Peter, I believe it was something that uh, he was used to doing, fishing, and it was something that he could do, and he his mind was never far from the Lord. Uh, you've often heard me say, uh, I'd like to go out and cut the grass because there's a sense of accomplishment. Every pastor uh, knows that the ministry never seems to be done. You can work uh, all the hours in the week, you can work all the hours in the day, and there's still something more to be done. So when I cut the grass, you know, I, I, I get out there and I can see what I've accomplished. I can get things done. And I also ponder, I think, and I, I, I think about things. I think about um, what the Lord is speaking to me. I think about what's going on in the ministry, what's going on in my family life, all those things. And I believe that uh, Peter went back to fishing. Some writers have said that he left the call and he went back to the old way. Well, quite possibly, and we have a tendency to do that and we have 
Uh, sometimes we want to do that. Sometimes people go back to the old nature before Christ, B.C. But I believe G, uh, Peter went fishing, and that was a place he could think. Uh, because they were there all night, and they were trying to catch fish, and they weren't catching anything. But I, I believe his mind, he was thinking about the Lord, uh, thinking about what Jesus would have him do and all the things that Jesus said. Going back, there was a meteorologist and he uh, had a terrible record of forecasting the weather and he decided to go back home. And uh, after many years, he, he lost that job because he wasn't a good meteorologist and he went back home and one man asked him, why did you come back home? And he got a job at the local station and he said, well, one of the reasons I came back home is the climate didn't agree with me. Now, you got to think about that a, a little bit. But Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And I believe Jesus or Peter was thinking about that, fishers of men. Uh, John Calvin details Thomas was with them. And this was the third appearance giving proof uh, to the resurrection of Jesus. So uh, John 21, 3 says, I'm going fishing, Peter said. We'll go with you, the disciples said. So sometimes we, we, in a time of spiritual drought or adversity, God is ready to turn the tide on something. They didn't understand that just in a few more hours they would see Jesus. They didn't know that. Let me challenge you that remain hopeful. Be ready. Because when you least expect it, Jesus is going to show up. So when you're reading the Word and you read that chapter and you didn't get anything out of it, read another chapter and read another chapter because guess what? Jesus is going to show up. He is the God who is there. He is the God who wants to meet you on the side, on the seashore. He is the God that wants to meet you for breakfast, and that's exactly what he was going to do here. So occupy your time. The disciples, they knew how to do this very well. They liked doing it, and it was profitable for them. Some people try to get a, a reasoning out of 153 fish, and they go into numerology. Let me tell you, numerology is a lousy way of Bible interpretation. One of the reasons that uh, they counted the fish and they, it was 153 is because there were seven people on that boat and this was profitable to them. And if they were going to draw an income, they would sell all those fish. But they wanted to know how every fisherman wanted to know how to divide the money. And so this could have been one of the ways, one of the reasons that they counted the fish. So I believe that um, Peter was pondering over the thoughts of, of Jesus. George MacDonald says, there is such a thing as a sacred idleness. And I would challenge you again, uh, meditate on the word of God. Start journaling, continue journaling, get back to journaling. Do some sacred idling. And uh, Brother Lawrence said this, think often on God by day, by night in your business, and even in your diversions. He will always be near to you Leave him not alone. <clears throat> think about the Lord. You would think it rude to leave a friend alone who came to visit you. Why then must God be neglected? <clears throat> so think about the Lord. Think about him. William Crimshaw said, meditation is the soul's chewing. The soul's chewing. I believe Peter was chewing on the events of the last few days. He was pondering on the events of the last two few days and what would happen and what had happened. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. Mary pondered about Jesus, and I believe Peter was pondering now about the Lord. Uh, and we need to continue to do that. And the second thought that I have is they were surprised by God. They were surprised. Jesus and the miraculous catch of fish. They heard a voice on the, side, on, on the seashore, and they said, throw the net on the other side. And sometimes maybe somebody on the shore could see a school of fish and the, where they couldn't see it from the boat. And so some people, they would fish that way and somebody would call out from the shore, throw the net over here, throw the net over there. And uh, so that could have been, it might've been a supernatural thing. Jesus just knew that there was a school of fish on the other side. And it might've been dark and he couldn't see, but he knew. And so that is a powerful thing. D.A. Carson says, 
they are coming to grips with the resurrection, but they still have not learned the profound truth that apart from Christ, you can do nothing. They toiled all night. They worked all night and they didn't accomplish anything. But Jesus said, do this. And they listened to him and they, they did it and they accomplished something. Um, then he calls them. Jesus met their need early in the morning. These were fishermen, emphasis on the men. They were hungry. They had been up all night, a little cranky if you, uh, you know, didn't catch anything all night. Uh, they were just ready to relax. Jesus was uh, meeting their needs early in the morning. Uh, my dad did that when I was in high school. He would get up and he would cook me breakfast in the morning. Maybe it would be oatmeal, it would be French toast or pancakes or whatever it is. My dad had a way of putting uh, apple slices in pancakes and they were wonderful. And so he would, it, it really it was mornings with my dad, breakfast and the Bible. He would read the Bible to me and he had devotions with me every morning before I went to high school. And that left a powerful impact on my life. And I would encourage you, have uh, breakfast with Jesus. Have that cup of coffee with Jesus. One ancient writer said, don't face any person in the morning before you face the Lord Jesus Christ. So have that time with the Lord. Probably so many spats in relationships because people do not face the Lord early in the morning and have that devotional time. I remember another story growing up and coming to Detroit at Grandma and Grandpa's house, Grandpa Weber. And Grandma, Grandma Weber was a wonderful breakfast cook, and she, uh, we would have pancakes, or we'd have waffles, or we'd have this whole spread, and we'd, we'd be eating this, and look over at the end of the table, and there's Grandpa in his big bowl of oatmeal. And what, if I remember anything about Grandpa Weber, I remember he would say this, the old horse needs his oats. And, that's just what I remember about Grandpa Weber in the morning and breakfasts. And now that I'm getting older, I understand what he's saying. But uh, he had a big old bowl of oatmeal. Jesus is the God who meets you early in the morning. He meets you cooking breakfast. And uh, very few people today uh, really have that servant's heart. See, he came and he prepared something. He was modeling out servanthood and continuing to model out servanthood. He know, knew what they were going through, knew what they needed. And so too much of the time people can see and watch work around the church or around what needs to happen, but they never get involved. I would challenge you, determine in your heart to get involved, be a true servant. If you see, be the first to fix something, be the first to clean something up, be the first to pick up that piece of paper, be the first person to, to clean up some debris in front of your church, in the entrance of your church, in the hallway of your church. Uh, be a servant. Learn a servant's heart. I believe that Jesus was still modeling the servant's heart out. There's a difference in this world when people serve. Uh, Wood, Woodrow Wilson said, no man has ever risen to the real stature of spiritual manhood until he has found that it is finer to serve somebody else than it is to, to serve himself. And uh, many people like to serve themselves or they like to do what they want to do, but they're, uh, they never see what really Jesus wants them to do. So Jesus was serving the disciples. He was serving them. And notice they, they didn't really recognize him uh, early in the morning, and, and there could be some reasons for that. Maybe they hadn't seen him for a while, and they weren't expecting him. And uh, I believe God reveals himself so much more often, but people do, do not expect to see him. Uh, maybe they had gone back to their own ways and didn't expect to see him. Maybe there wasn't that much light. Uh, maybe they were too far from Jesus, perhaps the morning fog. Uh, Kurt Warner said years ago, uh, retired quarterback in the NFL, every morning ha has to set a priority to get away with and be with Jesus. And that's what we need to do every morning, get away and be with Jesus. The day was breaking. It was early in the morning. It was still dark. And uh, Jesus manifested himself. I want to talk to you just briefly about that. Jesus manifested himself. He appeared. He revealed himself. 
And Jesus is revealing himself as he serves his disciples, as he meets their need, as he serves them. And uh, Jesus is the God who is there. And that's powerful. We need to know the God who is there, the God who is available, the God who shows up. Uh, we serve not a distant God, but we serve a God that shows up. And that was the Jesus that the disciples met that morning. And let me tell you, Christ will reveal himself just at the point of your need. He will re re reveal himself at the point of your greatest need. God will show up. And he usually shows up by way of uh, the word, the scripture. Find him in the scripture. You will find him in the scripture first. It was a supernatural miracle. Uh, and God worked that for them. He brought the fish in. Uh, now, it was hard work for them to bring the fish in, but many times the plan of the Lord and what God asks us to do is hard work, and we don't shrink back from hard work. James three or 4, 13 says, Now listen, who of you s s would say, Today or tomorrow we go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money? Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So when we find out some things that the Lord wants for us, we need to accomplish those. When we're reading the scripture and uh, it really prompts us to serve other people, we need to act on that service and we need to do those things. Always leave opportunity for Jesus to intervene in your plans. See, the disciples went fishing, but they uh, left opportunity. And I really believe that Peter had Jesus on his mind during that night. He was thinking about the things of the Lord. He was thinking about Jesus. And their fishing all night was a result of, one person could say, self uh, rather than God-determined activity. Not saying God didn't want them to go fishing. It was something they enjoyed. It was something they knew how to do. And God is certainly into enjoyment. He's not a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy life, enjoy things. And he wants us to be, to, to be profitable, as I said before. Um, but Christ is more willing to take care of your need than you are concerned about your need. Have you ever had Jesus do something for you that you didn't ask him to do? And in retrospect, you look back on that and said, wow, I didn't even ask him, but that was a need in my life and he met that need. See, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your need. He knows all about you and he knows what you're, you, you need and he knows what you're going through and he wants to meet those needs. Um, for Jesus, the death and resurrection did not take, his, take him from his friends, but gave him to his friends. So now he was alive, and he was there with his friends, and he was uh, really cooking them breakfast. And I believe the last point here, briefly, is he invited them into fellowship. Jesus is always inviting people into fellowship. He always wants to have fellowship with you. He wants us to have fellowship with one another. And uh, he is a, fellowship and relationship for Christ are predominant. He doesn't uh, ask us to follow him and then we become a lone ranger. He asks us to follow him and then we are connected to the body of Christ. All relationships here on earth must, must be filtered through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Must be filtered through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep these relationships pure and holy. Leave no room for temptation. Leave no room for reproach. Christ is well able to handle your relationships. He is able to heal your relationships. He is able to do those types of things. 
I believe that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you today and through this week. I believe he wants to open up his heart to you. I believe he wants to heal some areas deep within your spirit, deep within your soul. He wants to meet some needs during this time that you need met. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the same person I was last year. I want to be deeper in the Lord. I want to be better for those around me. I want to be a better person than ever before. That means I must change. I don't want to stay the same. And I, I, I talk to too many people that are the same person year after year after year after year. And let me tell you, friend, if some things keep re resurfacing in your, in your life, you need to either crucify those things, pray that they die, or you need to ask Jesus to heal some areas of your life and deep in your spirit, deep in your heart to make you renewed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, John 21 10 says, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. He was not afraid to give them credit and he did. He gave them credit. He, uh, you know, uh, Matthew chapter four, Satan tried to get Jesus when he tempted him. Turn these stones into bread. Where did the bread come from on the seashore? You can see where the fish came from, but where did the bread came from? Come from? Well, Jesus wasn't going to turn the bread into the stone into bread because Satan asked him to do that. Why would he listen to Satan? But now he was in control and he was trying to meet the needs of his friends. So quite possibly he could turn that bread or that, that stone into bread. And so one writer says, it seems to be Jesus's aim in this whole morning scene is to meet the needs of his disciples and to uh, help them out and to fellowship with them. Christ often makes difficulties that the means of a closer relationship with him. So if you're going through a difficult time, I challenge you, get in deeper with the Lord. He wants to reveal himself to you, and he will. And so I want to challenge you with some things as we close today. Uh, make a priority of daily Bible reading. Get back into the Word. Read much of the Scripture. Let the Scripture speak to you. Not what you thought it said. Not what you uh, understood it to say last year, but what does it say this year? As Spirit-filled people, uh, pray that the breath of God would, would breathe on you as you read that Scripture afresh and anew. Meditate on the, what Christ is asking of you. Number two, make it a priority to pursue Christ and his kingdom and uh, continue to enhance his kingdom. I want to thank you for giving and continuing to give your contributions to the church because it really helps. And it's not about uh, these things or that thing. It's about what God is doing in our life and what God asks us of us. And uh, the tithe is about honoring the Lord and about obedience to him and about giving to the kingdom of God. And thank you for doing that and continue to do that. Make a priority to reach somebody for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a time you could challenge somebody about Jesus and about what uh, Jesus would do in their, your, in their hearts and lives. And maybe many people would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. This is a soft time. This is a time when people are open to the Lord. And um, lastly, make a priority praying, giving, and serving to further the kingdom of God and other nations. Pray for our missionaries. Our missionaries are going through very difficult times at this moment in history. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I ask right now that if anybody is going through a difficult time of disillusionment, you are the God that meets us right there. You are the God that meets our needs. You are the God that serves us. You are the God that helps us. And you're the God that reveals yourself to us. Would you reveal yourself to each one as we march through these days today? This isn't a time of wastedness. This is a time of profitability. We are growing deep with you, within you. The church is growing deeper today than ever before. And I ask you right now to move on hearts and lives in living rooms 
in kitchens, in dining rooms, wherever people are. Help us to grow in you. We love you today. Lord, if anybody's searching for you, reveal yourself to them. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. And we ask that um, they would surrender their life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I challenge you today, if you haven't given your life to Christ, would you do it today? Surrender your life to Jesus. Jesus, I want to know you. I thank you that you died on the cross, but you didn't stay in the grave. You rose again on the third day for eternal life, for our eternal life. And I believe what you did on the cross, and I believe you're the Son of God. Paul said, by the evidence of his resurrection, that proves that he is the Son of God. God is alive and well in your heart today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.
Well, I'm so glad you joined us today. I trust that you were encouraged by the ministry of music and the preaching of the word. Uh, I thank you for uh, joining with us today, and we hope that you go in the precious name of the Lord. And let me just uh, bless you with the words of the Bible. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May his countenance be upon you, and may he give you peace. God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord and have a wonderful day.